Rutledge was a very pretty girl, according to historian David Herbert Donald, with fair skin, blue eyes, and auburn hair. A neighbor remembered that she was as pure in heart and kind of heart as an angel, full of love, kindness, sympathy. Herndon later claimed that Anne was the only woman that Lincoln ever loved. In the fall of 1835, however, Abraham was once again devastated by death. He lost Anne to typhoid. It was at this time, as we shall see in a moment, that Lincoln uh, experienced his first of two very prolonged and public emotional collapses. Next there was Mary Owens, with whom Lincoln had a love affair when he was 27. Abraham and Mary had an informal understanding that they would eventually wed. However, Mary went away for some months to return to her parents' home, and while she was gone, Lincoln began having second thoughts. Biographer David Herbert Donald recounts Lincoln's response to Mary's eagerness to wed this way. This is not, I'll tell you in advance, one of Lincoln's prouder moments, um, but it is, it's pretty hilarious to read about. It's not, it's not the image any of us have of Lincoln today. He feared that her coming so readily showed that she was a trifle too willing. He began finding defects in her appearance. From her first visit to New Salem, he remembered that she was pleasingly stout, weighing between 150 and 180 pounds, according to contemporaries. But now she appeared, in Lincoln's words, a fair match for Falstaff. Lincoln actually, he did himself less justice than, than Donald. Lincoln described it this way. This is how he explained the transformation. Now when I beheld her, I could for, not for my life avoid thinking of my mother. And this not from her withered features, for her skin was too full of fat to permit it, contra permit it contracting into wrinkles, but from her want of teeth, weather-beaten appearance in general, and from a kind notion that ran in my head that nothing could have commenced at the size of infancy and reached her present bulk in less than 35 or 40 years. So, wasn't, wasn't always kind to, to the ladies. The two were separated by a geography again for some months when Lincoln moved to, to New Salem, or from New Salem to Springfield. Lincoln took advantage of the opportunity to engage in a six-month campaign to convince Mary in writing that she should break off the engagement. Out of a sense of honor, apparently, he couldn't do it himself. He had to try to convince Mary to do it. He told Mary that she would be unhappy, uncomfortable, and poor if she came to Springfield to marry him. She would not fit in. Their match would cause her much physical and emotional distress. You have not been accustomed to hardship, he told her, and it may come, I'm sorry, and it may be more severe than you now imagine. He ended his final letter to Mary, saying, I am willing and even anxious to bind you faster if I can be convinced that it will in any considerable degree add to your happiness. Pretty appealing offer after everything else he's already said. Mary rejected Abraham's offer, unsurprisingly, and Lincoln was devastated. The rejection led him to believe that he actually might have loved the woman to begin with. This is what's going on in Lincoln's mind. Next, there was Mary Todd. You'll notice in a moment that this starts to sound a bit like a soap opera when I'm recounting Lincoln's love affairs. But next, there was Mary Todd, the cousin of Lincoln's neighbor, Elizabeth Edwards. Lincoln spent much of his time at the Edwards home seeing Mary, and the two eventually and, and entered an engagement. Ever indecisive in love, Lincoln came to believe that he and Mary Todd were a poor match, and soon became, he became infatuated with a number, another member of the household, 18-year-old Matilda Edwards. Lincoln broke off the engagement with Mary Todd, was rejected by Matilda, and had a second prolonged emotional collapse that we'll explore in just a few moments. While he was separated from Mary Todd, he proposed to yet another woman. Um, apparently, this was, he was just very eager to propose to people. I don't know if, if you guys had this experience in your coming of age, just propose to this person, next person. We'll see how it goes. 16-year-old <clears throat> Sarah Ricard rejected his offer in her words because the peculiar manner of his general deportment would not be likely to fascinate a young girl just entering the society world. So he's rejected yet again. As we know, Lincoln eventually returned to Mary Todd, but the two did not live happily ever after. If death and tempestuous love affairs were roadblocks in Lincoln's pursuit of happiness before marriage, they would continue to be afterward. As two of their four children died, and Mary famously exercised her demons. And of course, as Gleaves pointed out, a third child would die. Mary would experience the death of another child after losing her husband. 
But there is more to the story of Lincoln's unhappiness than a series of unfortunate events. There's a now famous story about Leo Tolstoy discussing Lincoln with a Muslim chieftain up in the Caucasus Mountains between Asia and Europe. I guess heard this one. No, okay, I guess not. I guess it's a little obscure. According to Tolstoy, Lincoln's fame and reputation had spread all the way to that isolated corner of the world. The chief reputedly saying of Lincoln, he spoke with a voice of thunder, he laughed with the sunrise, and his deeds were as strong as the rock. The chief's mood changed, however, when he had the opportunity to see a picture of Lincoln's face that Tolstoy presented to him. He gazed at it for several, several moments silently, Tolstoy later recalled, like one in reverent prayer, his eyes filled with tears. He was deeply touched, and I asked him why he became so sad. After pondering my question for a moment, he replied, don't you find, judging from his picture, that his eyes are full of tears and his lips are sad with secret sorrow. That sorrow that the chief saw in Lincoln's face, that melancholy, as his friends and colleagues referred to it, can be partially explained by the tragedies and the struggles that we just recalled. But there is something deeper, some quality inside of Lincoln that challenged him throughout his entire life. Biographer jo Joshua Wolf Shank recently explored the evidence and concluded that the deep pervasive sadness of Lincoln's mother, the strange spells of his father, his father would wander off in the woods muttering to himself for long periods of time, and the striking presence of mental illness in the family of his uncle and aunts suggests a likelihood of a biological predisposition toward depression in Lincoln. Lincoln's two emotional collapses one in the fall of 1835 after the, death, after the death of Anne, and one in January 1841 after his separation from Mary Todd, give us a glimpse into this profound depression that Lincoln had. They will give us a better sense of why his law partner William Herndon would later write, his melancholy dripped from him as he walked. And other colleagues would say it was the one thing in Lincoln that defined him, the one most noticeable quality was his profound melancholy. In both instances, friends feared that Lincoln had lost his mind forever and that he might commit suicide, as Gleaves mentioned, several later recalled hiding his razor blades and his knives for this reason. And in fact, a poem glorifying suicide appeared in a local paper and is widely attributed to Lincoln today. In both instances, Lincoln required considerable help from friends and even from medical doctors before he could eventually recover. According to historian Michael Burlingame, Lincoln likely underwent many of the customary procedures of that time, including a painful regimen of bleeding, leeching, the application of heated cups to his temples, mustard rubs, foul-tasting medicines, and cold water, water baths. Apparently this was pretty terrible. They'd have you sit in a hot tub and then jump into a cold tub and back into a hot tub. It sounds like not the most fun experience in the world. He made a public spectacle of himself, breaking down, crying, and talking of suicide. For not giving you a general summary of the news, you must pardon me, Lincoln wrote to a law partner in the, in the midst of his second collapse. It is not in my power to do so. I am now the most miserable man living. If what I feel today were equally distributed to the whole human family, there would not be one cheerful face on earth. Whether I shall ever be better, I cannot tell. I awfully for forebode, I shall not. To remain as I am is impossible, I must die or do better. Lincoln wrote this letter a month before his 32nd birthday, 20 years before he took the oath of office as president. How then do we explain Lincoln's rise? How do we explain his ability through death, horrible love affairs, and profound depression to even approximate happiness and his private life. Among the answers are three qualities we often remember Lincoln for today. His love of education, his sense of humor, and his abounding ambition 